You are listening to a pleasure podcast. For more from our sex podcast collective, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. Welcome to American Sex, the award winning podcast dedicated to challenging those puritanical, backward ass ideals that we have in the U.S. I'm Sunny Megatron, and my co host is Ken Melvoin Berg. We're sexuality educators, pleasure advocates, and ridiculous, sadistic kinksters. We're also non monogamously married to each other. So strap in or strap one on. In this house, your pleasure is power. Your kink is customizable. And your subversive perversions are revolutionary. Welcome, my friends, to episode 202 of American Sex. Our guest this week is Mike Stabile. He just appeared in the Netflix documentary, Money Shot, the Pornhub story. And he joins us for a conversation about Pornhub, more specifically the aftermath of the very public controversy that hit the mainstream in December 2020 by way of a damning New York Times article about trafficking and the dark side of Pornhub. Now, our conversation goes deep into the nuance of this controversy and the issues that it uncovered, deeper than what you saw on the Netflix special. And there's nuance, all right. It is not a black and white issue. And There's a whole lot of other dangerous stuff under the surface, too. So a little bit of what we touch on in our conversation. Now, you know, one, while we all agree that sexual exploitation of any kind is absolutely never excusable, we talk about why many of these anti-trafficking organizations aren't what they seem. We also touch on what Pornhub did wrong and what they did right. Why those on the front lines of this industry, the adult performers, are our best resource for checks and balances and safety. How this seemingly isolated, very industry-specific issue affects every single one of us via free speech and censorship issues. Uh, We touch on what is the deal with that surprise announcement. I don't know if you heard the day after the documentary dropped a couple weeks back. Pornhub was purchased by a company named Ethical Capital Partners. So we talk about what that's all about. And as has been for our last few episodes that all seem to be about very different subjects, when you peel back the onion layers on all of those episodes, we're all fighting the same fight. So, you know, it's it's been a theme the last few episodes. Now, if you're not familiar with Mike Stabile, let me introduce you. He's an activist, journalist, and documentary filmmaker who's written about and advocated for the rights of sex workers and sexual speech for over a decade. His firm, Polari Media, has developed press and media strategies for some of the adult industry's most well-known brands. Mike currently serves as the Director of Public Affairs at the Free Speech Coalition, the trade and advocacy group for the adult industry. Now, I've also worked with Mike on various projects throughout the years, and the latest is Zipper Magazine. Now, if you don't know Zipper yet, uh, you should. I'm the editor-in-chief of this online magazine that's all about kink education, culture, and community. So if you missed that announcement, head on over to zippermagazine.com to check it out. Now, before we roll that conversation, y'all, we have got to talk. There is some shit going down that needs all of our attention stat. So it's about this so-called TikTok ban, aka the Restrict Act, Senate Bill 686, and Restrict stands for the Restricting the Emergence of Security Threats that Risk Information and Communications Technology Act. So yeah, this is not a TikTok ban at all. Let me catch up real quick with how this has unfolded so far and how we got to where we are today. So last week, which is the week of March 20th, 2023, the CEO of TikTok, Sho Chu, 
testified before Congress, and there were plenty of social media posts making fun of the asinine questions that he was being asked by members of Congress. You know, like, does your tic tac connect to the home Wi-Fi systems of God-fearing American citizens, giving the evil commie Chinese government access to control any and every electronic device in American citizens' homes, including and not limited to your Alexa garage door opener uh, or like you know how does your evil company track the pupil dilation information it gets from spying through the cellular mobile telephone camera lens while the unsuspecting American citizens are hypnotized into a trance by watching your cat videos and and teenagers dancing uh, while they're simultaneously gobbling down Benadryl and, you know, chasing them with a Tide pod for some challenge on your brainwashed app. Okay, I'm, I am exaggerating. I'm joking. Uh, But (laughs) kind of not that much. If you hadn't heard clips from those hearings it was it was horrible it was embarrassing it was it was racist it was disrespectful like the whole nine it was it was pretty bad but long story short the u.s is calling this a tiktok ban on the assumption that despite having you know tiktok having all of their data collection and storage done by oracle on u.s soil that the chinese are doing horrible things with u.s citizens data to the point of it being a serious national threat And what's come out and also has been clearly proven, like hit the Google, there's lots on this. Meta, who owns Facebook and Instagram, was behind a multi-year disinformation campaign, like in media outlets and online magazine articles and news stories and all of that stuff, basically uh, bashing TikTok, making it seem like a threat to our children and our national security. And, you know, all these kids are doing these challenges when it turns out a lot of that wasn't true. And also, like, speaking of using American citizens' data for nefarious purposes or being a national security threat by influencing our society, our elections, our government, etc. Hi, Facebook, Meta, Cambridge Analytica, you know, do I have to go on? No, I don't. So. Yeah, all this happened last week, and it, it was weird. It was it was weird. And this quote TikTok ban. I'm, I'm doing the finger quotes. Has near unanimous bipartisan support. It was introduced by a Democratic politician, Senator Mark Warner. So yeah, it's a big deal, and it might actually happen. And. When the hearings were happening, we knew, oh, this was a restrict act, you know, Senate Bill 686. But the law, nothing was written. We didn't have the text for the bill, right? And if you are one of the 150 million Americans that uses TikTok, that's one in three people, you know that this app is not, oh, a bunch of kids doing silly dances to silly songs and doing weird challenges that are dangerous. It's a place where We found community, when I say we people of all ages, we found empowerment, uh, and we get real time, like on the front lines happening now news. So I want you all, whether you're on TikTok or not, to do something to prove this point, right? Go to Instagram, which is TikTok's major competitor, owned by Meta, put in Paris, And what will you see when you search Paris that comes up? It's like, oh, here's me and my besties by the Eiffel Tower on vacation eating some croissants. And, you know, it's like pretty pictures, like what you think of. It's beautiful Paris, right? Travel, yada, yada. So now go into TikTok and search Paris. And it is very different. It's like, you know, people like, okay, here we are. Uh, The protests have now turned into riots. As you can see, the burning cars all around me. You know, I can't breathe. Uh, Right now, as I am making this TikTok, a fellow protester, as you can see, is pouring milk into my open eyeballs um, to alleviate the burning and the blindness from police tear gas. (laughs) It's like video after video after video of people right in the middle of stuff talking about what's going on. 
And so now the same is true when you try looking up the Restrict Act or S.686 or Senate Bill 686 or, you know, TikTok, all that stuff, right? Many, many different keywords. Now, remember how during the hearings I said that the text of the bill wasn't available yet, like P- People didn't know exactly what this TikTok ban was. It was released over this past weekend after the hearings. Um, um, oh, um, so TikTok or its owner ByteDance is not mentioned in this bill by name at all, right? So the Restrict Act, Senate Bill 686, again, introduced by Senator Mark Warner, It gives the Secretary of Commerce the power with little to no checks or balances to, quote, take any action necessary to shut down information and communication technologies, products or services if they are connected to a, quote, foreign adversary of the United States and pose an, quote, undue and unacceptable risk to the national security of the U.S., to the citizens, et cetera. So products, right? What, what are we talking about when we're saying like electronic, blah, 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 pretty much everything, you know, uh, apps with over a million users, gaming console communication. So like how you talk to people on your Xbox or you use your Xbox and you hook into the network, uh, any social media platform or messaging platform that uh, we use that has over a million users, which is most of the major ones, right? Million users isn't really a lot. Personal data websites, like you use your banking app and all of that stuff, right? Payment apps, uh, your ring camera, your home devices, so many things, cell phones, Zoom, the list goes on. It's it's like pretty much everything, right? And, you know, connected to a foreign adversary is a broad and ill-defined, like, what does that mean, right? Connected to many, if not most of these electronic and communication products, they maybe use parts or services, et cetera, that are foreign. Maybe they're from China. Maybe they're from, I don't know, somebody else who isn't our enemy right now, but they will be next year or two years from now. We don't know. Now, imagine if this very vague and very all sweeping law that pretty much boils down to a full ban on a free use of the internet, right? It allows for surveillance of personal and home devices and home network, like home networks are on there, uh, game consoles, ring cameras, you know, all that websites, apps, you know, all that stuff I mentioned before. Now imagine if this very vague and broad all sweeping uh, bilk becomes law and then gets into the hands of somebody like Ron DeSantis of Florida, the governor of Florida, who, you know, right now we've got book burnings, we've got all these anti trans bills, we've got, you know, we can't say gay, can't say gay there, um, taking trans kids from their parents, removing them from their homes, uh, introducing bills, giving heavy penalties to people who speak out against the government, whether they reside in Florida or not. And, you know, he's gunning for the White House in 2024. So imagine this bill in the hands of somebody like that, right? Oh, and by the way, that's part of the Restrict Act. People are like, well, I'll just use a VPN. I'll get around to, you know, if they ban TikTok. No, the penalty for attempting to circumvent any restrictions, like with the VPN, 20 years in prison and up to a $1 million fine. So yeah, oh, and they'll seize all your assets. So this is why people are alarmed. And when I say people, I mean people across party lines. I've seen just as many conservatives outraged about this as uh, leftists or progressive folks. Even Tucker Carlson the other night, I was like, am I dreaming? I am not believing my eyes. What am I seeing? What is happening? But he had a whole segment, like just calling the Restrict Act out as the bullshit it is. And then, and then put up a video of AOC making her first TikTok talking about like how the Restrict Act is bullshit, played a portion of her TikTok. And then when it ended, he didn't go like, 
this is Freaky Friday and this is weird and I can't believe I am agreeing with AOC and I just aired her. No, just went right into like, and she's right. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what's happening? Uh, <laughs> like, this is, whoo, this is, this is some stuff, y'all. And the thing that really gets me is the internet suppression that's happening with this bill. If you're on TikTok, Odds are, in your timeline, there is video after video after video digging into, you know, exactly what this Restrict Act is uh, set to do. If you're on Twitter, you're going to see stuff to a lesser extent, but that's limited because, what's his face, uh, just announced like all blue check marks will be gone in like a couple of days. And by the 15th, the only tweets that are going to be put out into like the timeline or the for you page are people who pay Twitter blue to have the check mark. So, you know, there goes that town square, everybody has an equal voice sort of vibe. (sighs) So I tried posting about the restrict act on Facebook, four times, because I am not seeing anybody talking about on Facebook. And now I know why because like those posts, it's like, two likes, one view. I think the best one, five likes, like nobody seeing it. And then when I go to Facebook and I search, it's the same sort of thing. I do see a few posts, like a short handful, maybe five, six of just when I search all of Facebook, all types of posts, and they hardly have any engagement or views. So it's like, huh. And then also, the weirdest thing, I go to Google because I'm like, oh, I'm going to tweet some of the articles, you know, that indie journalists are writing and you know, all the publications. It happens all the time, right? Nothing, nothing. And I'm Googling all the words. I know how to Google, right? I'm using the quotes, the not quotes. I'm doing different different types of search terms. That it, No, I'm getting the actual bill. I'm getting very dry and official government type websites like this is a summary of the bill and very legal blah, 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 boring talk uh nothing nobody's saying like no this is what it's really going to mean no this is how it's going to translate into you know this is how it can be abused nothing and it's really weird it's real weird so please i urge you to look more into this if you are on tiktok i'm on tiktok i'm sunny megatron everywhere i have reposted every single video that I have seen explaining what the ramifications of the restrict act will be. And, and I have been posting, doesn't matter if it's a conservative person, a progressive, politically progressive person, like everyone's united on this, you know, except for Congress and Senate, like everyone not in the government is pretty united on this. And it's really, really important. So if you go to my reposted videos, which is like, you go to my profile, and you go, I think, like, I don't know, four icons over, you can see all of the videos I've reposted. And they're pretty much all exclusively this. Please learn about it. Talk about it. Try to post it on the social media where it's not getting much traction, because people need to know about this. And secondly, you and also the people you tell about this, encourage them to as well, write their legislators. There's a few ways you can do this. And I am going to have links in the show notes to the bill, to different ways you can contact your lawmakers. Now, remember, this bill has widespread bipartisan support. It said that Biden is in favor of it too. And it is moving very, very quickly. So thankfully, like I said, lots of bipartisan opposition too, as long as people know about it. So you can use an app like ResistBot, R-E-S-I-S-T dot bot, and you can through your text messages, construct and send a letter to your lawmakers. Even better is to actually call them or email directly. I will have a link in the show notes to a website where you put in where you live, it'll tell you exactly who your representatives are, how to contact them, super easy. If you're even a little bit familiar with ChatGPT, it is free. I believe it's openai.com. I'll put it in there. If you're not sure what to write, if you want to write a personalized letter, you can put a few notes into ChatGPT. Like, I think this, that, this, and that. Please, ChatGPT, Put that in a letter to my state representative, 
who was such and such and such and such. And the, it will spit back to you the exact points you want to say, but it'll put it in nice letter format and, you know, put words around it. So it sounds like you really know what you're talking about. And I know you do, but sometimes words are hard for me. Sometimes words are hard. I get it. And you can even use it to give you a quick phone script if you opt to call your lawmakers as well. So seriously, you know, this along with everything else that's going on with all the anti-trans bills and uh, it, it is terrifying. And I am just beside myself that more people aren't hearing about this and how like I hate to sound like a conspiracy theorist. And I know I, maybe I'm kind of naive. Maybe I'm like, they wouldn't do that. But I'm like, you know, I routinely post about when it was SESTA FOSTA, the Earn It Act, Section 230. When these things come up, I talk about them on all of my social media. And yeah, sure, sometimes they're suppressed a little bit. That's just the nature of the game. But I've never seen anything like this. Never. I don't know what the hell's going on. So again, this is happening fast. We can't afford to snooze and let's, you know, stop this from happening. Thank you so much. Anyway, I know it's a lot, but it was important. And it also kind of has to do with our episode. Kind of goes hand in hand. You'll see with Mike. Uh, and I think maybe we just washed the balls already, which is housekeeping here on American Sex. And I guess that was more like housekeeping and Senate keeping. <laughs> I love my puns. Anyway, um, you can get the noise though. So there's the noise because I know you love my noises. Uh, and as far as washing the balls, I think the only other thing I left out is like, hey, in that episode description where all the things are, there's more things to uh, everything that Mike and I bring up in our conversation, including a link to the Netflix documentary. I also have links to discounts on our episode sponsors, our Patreon page page, links to uh, access to our free Discord community, and the link to my free kink negotiation mini workbook. So check all of that out. And you know what? If you enjoy American Sucks, consider going on your, your Apple podcast or your Spotify and giving us a review too. We would appreciate it. And that's it. These balls are clean. There we go. And uh, here is my conversation with Mike Stabile about Pornhub, censorship, free speech, and beyond. I'm excited, as I am every week. I mean, I, I have to compliment myself. I pick really good guests. I put together a good show. Um, but we have Mike Stabile on the line to talk about some stuff that might be kind of heavy, might be kind of important. But, you know, like the conversations we have here on American Sex, like we make it fun, even though it's like, oh, shit, this is real life. Uh, hi, Mike. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> Sunny. How's it going? Good, good. You know, it, it's 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 funny. Like just lately, with everything, like we're sitting here today recording when like the TikTok uh, hearings are happening, and there's all this stuff. And I don't know, as somebody who is in this industry and it really cares about censorship, it feels like we're on like a runaway car right now, or like speed, like we're on the bus and there's no brakes. Uh, how are you feeling? Oh, just about everything, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am on that, that runaway car with you, <laughs> for better or worse. Um, and, and hopefully one of us can sort of find the brakes. I, I think that like, what we're seeing is, you know, culturally, you know, there is, um, you know, a panic because technology has gotten ahead of where the legislators are and where a lot of parents are, frankly. Mm -hmm. Right. So so things seem to be moving too fast. Um, I mean, obviously, we, we talk about that in terms of the, you know, the, the car, but I'm talking about in terms of technology, in terms of culture, in terms of sexuality. I think that there are a lot of people who feel that they are on another car that is like moving super fast and they want to put up the race. And I think that's where we're seeing, you know, whether it's with TikTok or whether it's with age verification laws on the internet or whether it is any other form of censorship in terms of books and in, in school libraries and stuff like that, you see a lot of people, and, and, and this is sort of the, the sort of the opposite of progressive is regressive, right? People who are conservative, who want to really stop things in their tracks. So the good news is 
we're not the only ones that feel things are out of control. The bad news is the people who are driving the train are, you know, don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's there. It's so much. It's so much. And, you know, I was like really pleasantly surprised because you were in the Netflix uh, money shot porn was porn hub story on the Netflix. Hub story, so, yeah. And and for listeners who I call American fuckers because it's American sex magazine or magazine. Oh my God, my brain podcast. <laughs> um I will have the link in, sh- in the show notes to that documentary or anything we end up talking about during this episode that needs more context. Go to those show notes for this episode. Um I was really pleasantly surprised and happy to see your smiling face in this documentary and your like voice of reason and clarity. So I guess let's start there with the Pornhub documentary. For those who haven't seen it, give us like a recap of like, who is MindGeek? What do they have to do with Pornhub? What the hell happened? And why is there a documentary? Sure. So I'll tell you, you know, I um, obviously I I work with the Free Speech Coalition, which is the adult industry trade organization. Um, You know, it's been around 30 or so years and and fought numerous battles Um, and, you know, sort of work as an ersatz spokesperson for the industry often. Right. People will call and and sort of say, hey, I'm, I'm working on this or I'm a journalist looking at this or I'm a legislator working on this. And, you know, about two years ago, I got a call from a director said, who said, you know, listen, I've got a project at Netflix. I want to do a documentary on the way in which credit card processing in particular and banking discrimination is impacting sex workers. And this came, let's see, this would have probably been spring of 2021, uh-huh. uh, somewhere, somewhere in there. And to give that a little bit of context, if you remember in 2020, um, you know, there had been a massive story and an opinion piece by a journalist named Nick Kristoff in the New York Times that basically accused Pornhub of profiting from sex trafficking and, and child rape. And he had a sort of like, uh, you know, a, a penny dreadful, essentially, of like the crimes and the things that happened in Pornhub, some of which, you know, may have accurate, you know, may have a basis, some and just be decontextualized, other ones or a little bit um, foggier in terms of whether or not they w- were true accusations. Um, and so he had, uh, and this was coming on the heels of, to go back a little further, a campaign by faith-based groups um, called Trafficking Hub, okay. which, so starting in, and maybe, <laughs> sorry, I should have started at the beginning. So, right, we... <laughs> no, we're all over the, like, we, yeah, we like right. to bounce all over. <laughs> it's an adventure. <laughs> back. Piece by piece, so you could <laughs> could hold it. So, early two thousand or early twenty twenty, we have the COVID lockdowns. Around that same time, um, there is a spike in interest in pornography. Right, you even have public health departments um, coming out and saying, you know, watch porn, don't go hook up, and, and things like right. that. Um, that gives fuel to a new movement by faith-based groups called Trafficking Hub. What they were trying to do was use accusations of sex trafficking um, or basically child porn or uh, revenge porn, you know, on Pornhub to um, to have the site taken down. So you had these sort of faith-based groups that over the course of 2020 were really running this campaign and saying, we need to shut it down, shut it down, shut it down, shut it down. Um, and in 2020, December 2020, Nick Kristoff writes this article. It gets a lot of attention. Visa and MasterCard pull their their uh, funding from Pornhub. They pull their Pornhub's ability to process credit cards. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of people go to Pornhub. They think it's a free site. Where are their credit cards? Well, Pornhub and, and prior to OnlyFans, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and sites like that um, allowed for people to buy clips directly from performers. Right. And so this had been a a bustling business, not just for them, but also for the people who were selling content on it. So um, Visa and MasterCard pulled their funding based on these accusations of, uh, you know, sex trafficking videos on Pornhub. And who gets hurt? The people who were trying to sell their own videos. Right. Individual creators who were uploading things, who were uploading their ID, who were doing all of this stuff. Um, And so. uh Visa and MasterCard start introducing new regulations, you know, 
that make it tougher for people to sell their content directly um, to a fan, right? Rather than going through a studio or an agent or something like that. And um, and this director calls me and says, you know, I read that story and I wondered where are the performers? How is how are how do they fit into this, right? Um, and so we talked over the, the course of several months. I sat for an interview in the fall of 2021. Um, over the course of two days, we talked about a lot of different things. And then, you know, as these things do, you sort of forget about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, until about a month ago, I got a call and said, that the movie's coming out. We'd like to send you a screener so you could take a look. Netflix would like you to be available for press. If you're willing, you know, watch the the video and, and do it. And, and that's sort of where it is. So the the video, the, the movie that is on Netflix now, and I think that was it was in the top two or three in the country yeah. on Netflix this, this week um, is called Pornhub. No, it's called Money Shot, the Pornhub story. And it takes you through all of that, right? It talks about, um, you know, what Pornhub or its parent company, MindGeek, is, mm-hmm. um, you know, where it came from, uh, how it fits into the larger industry and the history of the industry, um, the accusations that were made against it. Um, and then, you know, how the removal and and of credit card processing really hurt of these hurt these creators. And while this does seem it might seem like a narrow story, right? Oh, there's a porn website and people were selling content on it. Um, and what's the big deal? You know, the, why okay. should I pay attention? Why is Netflix doing a doc? I think that it hits a lot of larger issues, right? About censorship, about um the the problems with moderating moderating. Okay. Um, on the internet, just not just on porn sites, and then the ways in which, um, you know, financial institutions, particularly banks and credit cards, really control what we can or can't see online. Yeah, yeah. And also, too, you know, and and for for those really regular listeners that have been really in it, who are geeks about this stuff, like this is just a different version of the same thing that's been going on for decades upon decades upon decades. And, you know, it's a lot of the like, oh my goodness, but what about the children? Oh my goodness, but what about the women? And it's very black and white and one-sided and anything you say that's like, but, but wait a minute. It's like, oh, so you want children to die? It's like, oh, Um, and it's just kind of a rehashed version of that same. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that what has happened. I mean, the, in this is that thirty years ago, you know, when the Free Speech Coalition started, and this is sort of late eighties, uh, early nineties. Um, you know, the main component of censorship was the federal government, right? Mm-hmm. The federal government, if they did not like what you were selling, the FBI would go in, they would order a videotape, a VHS or a magazine to some conservative town in Utah, and then you would get prosecuted for obscenity. That was how um, these things went. When the internet came of age, right, in early, you know, in the late 90s, but particularly in the early 2000s, when streaming became a viable way to sell content, when, when, and this is when I got into the industry, inter- companies were just moving online mm-hmm. um, in, a, in a significant way and selling memberships and things like that. Um, it did two things. One, it took away the government's ability, by and large, to prosecute for obscenity, because mm-hmm. the government depends on something called community standards, um, in order to prosecute, in order to get a judgment of obscenity, it has to violate the community standards of that town. And that's why they would order a VHS tape to somewhere in Utah, because they would hope that, you know, a gay BDSM scene would be against their community standards and you could bring down this company. Right. Um, so when you, but when you're on the internet, community standards are, what are the community standards, right? It's, it's the entire world. And it's something where grandparents are looking at two girls, one cup. How do you say that this thing violates community standards? So the government loses the ability to bring these charges by and large. There are a couple of cases in the early 2000s, but by and large, obscenity prosecutions, uh, which had already been low under the uh, Clinton administration, are unable to be revived in a significant way during uh, the second Bush administration. The second thing that happens is that credit cards suddenly start making charges, choices about what they are going to process and what they're not. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'm sure, you know, your listeners are aware, right, that becomes things. Those are things that are um, very arbitrary. Right? right. They tend to affect kink and fetish more than they I mean, that's 
who initially sort of get targeted. When I first got in the industry, you couldn't sell um, scenes that had BDSM and that had, that had bondage and penetration. That was an it was like you get one or the other. You not, could get one yeah. or the other. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I mean, that's sort of what what and and what has happened. I guess to the point of the Pornhub doc is that you have um, the, these these groups, these anti obscenity groups that have been around for decades and decades and decades. These faith based groups have learned that you know if you pressure the federal government, nothing's really going to happen. They're not able to do anything. But if you start pressuring banks and credit cards, then you can really extract pain, right? Then you can really, you know, and, and, and hopefully, I mean, this is things that they say vocally, they want it all shut down. So they may talk about trafficking. They may talk about CSAM, which is child sex abuse material, or what we used to call child porn. Um, You know, but really what they want, that's a means to an end to sort of shut down sex in the public square, right? They right. don't want to, they don't want porn. They don't want nudity. They don't want sex ed. Um, mm-hmm. So that's, that's sort of the, the, how we got to where we are now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's a lot. It is a lot. And so like when Pornhub came along, you know, like I said, these issues aren't black and white. You know, no. there there's lo- lots of sides to the story. And I know that Pornhub is a big business and there's a lot of talk about like they are in the data business, similar to like a Facebook or, no. you know, like a TikTok or, or whatever. So there's that component. Um, there's also the other component of, OK, people with all the accusations and the censorship, like all the stuff you're accusing uh, you know, or or claiming has happened, it like you said, it's being stretched and turned, and yeah, and some are just flat out wrong, right? Um, however, there were some things that um sex workers were saying about Pornhub's operations and about like age verification and things yes. like that. And it's like now looking back in hindsight, some of those holes have like slippery sloped into opening the door for all of these accusations yeah. of this mess. So talk about that stuff a little bit. Yeah, I mean, Pornhub is not at all perfect in this, right? And I think mm-hmm. that, you know, what we saw, you know, and Pornhub was something, at least in the early days, it was started in 2007, 2008. You know, when it first came onto the scene, it was seen as the devil within the industry, right? It was, it was not, it was, you know, it was similar to Napster or LimeWire or or BitTorrent or any of these sites where stuff was being pirated and stuff was being uploaded. And there were very lax standards as to, you know, specifically verifying, you know, who the uploader was or whether they had rights to the content. And so a lot of people in the industry really had a negative view of Pornhub. Right. And, and, and what at that point, their parent company was, was Manwin or, or, or Mansef. Mm-hmm. Um, but Pornhub was seen as a destroyer in the industry. And for a lot of performers, um, you know, in the early uh, 2010s and the, the early teens, um, you know, they were seeing as, as people started going out and producing their own content and trying to sell their own content, it was ending up on Pornhub. Right. So they didn't what they were calling for often was, hey, listen, we want you to verify who your uploaders are. We don't want you to be taking our content and pirating our content. Um, We don't want that allowed. We don't want people to have the ability to download content because what was happening is someone would upload content, say that was stolen. There would be a, you know, a report filed and that would get taken down. But meanwhile, 10,000 people had downloaded that content and were uploading it to, you know, Pornhub again or to Reddit or to, you know, any file sharing service or, or whatever it is. So, um, there were a lot of things that, that performers were asking and that studios were asking of porn. Mm-hmm. Um, and along with that, obviously, are um, is illegal content, right? So you start seeing revenge porn or, you know, again, CSAM, right? Stuff is getting uploaded. Um, you know, it's, you know, sometimes it's being caught, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's being alerted and being taken down. Um, you know, but I think that the the base of what um, you know, what some of these faith-based groups and, and some of what Nick Crystal found isn't entirely wrong. I think that like that certainly Pornhub 
and Pornhub today is, is obviously much different, right? They verify all uploaders. If you are monetizing content, they are making sure that you are of age and that you have the consent and the, the model releases and all of that. Um, and that's been going on for a certain number of years. And then before that, there were sort of lesser, but if you're talking about 2007, 2008, 2009, you know, it's a little bit more of a wild west. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when a lot of these complaints come from, right? A lot of the complaints that we're seeing surface now are complaints that are 10 years old, right? Mm. Or, 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 you know, more. And so in the, the context is that in 2010, 2011, Pornhub was not the only company that was doing this. And it wasn't only an adult company. There was, we had a much different sense of what the internet was and what was permitted. So if you think about like sex tape leaks, right? Mm-hmm. Or you think about the way that, that, Sites like Gawker, you know, would treat, um, you know, someone's nude coming out or being like, it was almost, there was almost a victim blaming mentality that went on. It was like, well, you shouldn't have done this, right? If you think about Paris Hilton or Kim Mm -hmm. Kardashian, right? Um, It was this like, well, why did you do that? And like, you get what you 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 want. Um, And so I think that, you know, Pornhub obviously has its own, has had its own issues and has had to come to terms with it's past obviously has been sold many t- you know a few times in the in see you know since those early days but yeah i don't think that it was perfect but i think that one of the things that i try to rant is that like the internet wasn't perfect like this isn't this isn't a porn hub problem this and i think that one of the 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 other speakers in the doc says this is not a porn hub problem this is an internet problem what has happened is the um the anti porn groups have tried to make it a Pornhub problem have tried to sort of position it as this is only happening on Pornhub when in fact Facebook has 20 million um, reports of CSAM every year. So Mm -hmm. this is not something where, you know, Pornhub has dramatically less, right? Um, and, and, And many of those are caught before they even go live. So I think that it's not that I want to disparage anybody who has had this happen to them or that we want to discount it and say, it's not a big deal. No, it's a huge deal, right? If you're 13 years old and you get assaulted and that video goes up on Pornhub, even if they remove it two days later, that's a big deal, right? That is mm-hmm. that is life-changing for you. The issue is that what these groups try to claim is that Pornhub knew this was happening and that Pornhub profited off it. And I think that that is where, um, you know, people who, don't understand the industry or don't understand the the complexity of moderation get lost and, and say, oh, well, they must be doing that because people are accusing them of that. And I think that that's where it's flat out wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of what's going on right now with the TikTok hearings and, you know, everyone and it's, they're just a mess. Oh my God, are they a mess? But like, <laughs> oh, uh, oh, you're doing this and you're doing that. And everyone's like, have you seen Facebook? Have you seen that? Like, why is, you know, the ills of the entire landscape falling on one company that, yeah, maybe some shit happens on TikTok. Yeah. You know, it's not a utopia, but hi, again, Cambridge Analytica and all the, you know, like what's happening here? Breaking news. Our friends at Manscaped not only now have beard products, they've just released their brand new Weed Whacker 2.0. Yeah, Manscaped, the leaders in below-the-waist grooming, are traveling north. North to where? Well, who knows? (laughs) Well, actually, I knows. Get it? It's a pun, like to your nose. On your face? Who knows? Or Well, whose nose? Your nose. Actually, everybody's nose. The new Weed Whacker will whack those pesky nose hairs. And, you know, since I'm on a roll, you knows. I've also got the hookup for you, right? Code SUNNY, S-U-N-N-Y, gets you 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. You heard about the beard products, right? Let me introduce you to the Beard Hedger Pro Kit. The centerpiece in this kit is the Beard Hedger, the only beard trimmer you will ever need. It's got a titanium-coated T-blade that is tough on hair and smooth on your face. It's waterproof, cordless, and gives you 20 hair-cutting lengths, all with one guard. So it's like, no, messy guard's over. You can't find the one you need. You know, it's uh, so you don't have to deal with that anymore. The Pro Kit also comes with four dermatologist-tested post-trim formulations like Manscaped's Beard Shampoo and Conditioner, Beard Oil, and Beard Balm. You get 
free gifts, a beard brush, comb, scissors, and you know, we've been a tried and true Manscaped household for years. And let me tell you, the Beard Hedger Pro Kit does not disappoint. If you want to go all out, check out the Performance Package 4.0. It comes with the Weed Whacker 2.0 and a bunch of other below-the-waist grooming products that Manscaped is known for. Now remember, you knows I got you. I got the hookup. 20% off and free shipping with code SUNNY at manscaped.com. That's M-A-N-S-C-A-P-E-D.com. Again, 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com with our code SUNNY. Cambridge Analytica and all the, you know, like yeah. what, what's happening here? It's, I mean, I think that the, the, again, you have people, especially in at yeah, the congressional level or, or, or at the governmental level, I should say, who don't have familiarity with these tools. Right. So what all they hear is the horror stories, right? right? They don't understand that this is something that happens across the internet, right? If you want to, to really cherry pick things and say, oh, this is happening on this site, this site is terrible, or on this app, this app is terrible. And you're like, no, anybody, you know, we don't blame the phone company. You know, when someone, you know, um, sex traffics using the phone, right? We don't assume that the phone company knew or, well, the phone company had a subscription and they should have known that somebody was using that, you know, phone call to find, you know, people to, you know, rape this woman or whatever. It's like, we don't have that idea, but somehow with computer technology, with the internet, we have this idea that, that they should, that they must have known, right? And that they're not doing enough. And ultimately it's, the internet is scary. It's an open, you know, your base. It's like having your kid live in the city, right? And there are risks that come with that. There are mm-hmm. benefits that come with that as well, right? Having an open and free society, but things are going to happen. And like, it's not necessarily, you know, New York's fault if somebody gets hurt in New York, you know, any more than it's at and fault if, you know, uh, somebody is kidnapped using a phone, um, you know, or TikToks if somebody's using it. Like, yes, we always can be working towards this. And most platforms are. Most platforms are trying to figure out how to do this. But bad actors and criminals always find sort of ways around it, you know. And, right. and I think that we, what we always can be doing is doing our best. But it doesn't mean that the answer is to just to shut technology down or shut the Internet down. And I think that that's ultimately what some of these people would like to see. Yeah. And, you know, again, like I'm always that pattern seeker looking at like, oh, it's this again. Uh, It's the same sort of thing when the Bill Sesta-Fosta were introduced and American Fuckers, I'll put a link in the show notes to a a whole episode we did on that. And it's like, ask the people who are on the front lines how to make that environment or that landscape better and how to improve the things that aren't working or the things that do have holes and that could lead to dangerous things that there are leading to dangerous things rather than, you know, throwing out the bathwater, the baby, the whole yeah. house, the, you know, everything you can think of. Um, and I, I see it very much in the same respect here. Um, not listening to the folks that are using that platform that know the ins and outs. So, um, let's talk about, I know one of the things that, uh, has come up a lot is like, oh my goodness, like the moderation, you know, that, oh, they don't have hardly any moderation. They just let whatever go. And actually like some the moderation with adult content is actually some of the best most state of the art more thoughtful can you talk a little bit more about what that what adult moderation looks like sure so i think that as long as i have been in the adult industry it has been super vigilant particularly around csam right um we know in the industry how um not just how ethically dangerous it is, but but how dangerous it is for individual companies if they knowingly distribute CSAM. So just to give you an idea, I think that the 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 federal crime for distributing child pornography is something around your the realm of 15 years per image. Mm. Right? 15 years in federal prison per image. Good. Um, yeah. You know, this is something that our industry takes very seriously. It's, right. it's why we check IDs so aggressively. 
when we're doing shoots, right? We, we, we don't want to cross that line as much as, you know, you know, if someone may look young or whatever, they're adults. We want this is, and this is content for adults. So when you get into tube sites, I think that that still cares. Obviously I can't speak to what was happening with uh, Pornhub in 2007, 2008, 2009. Um, but my sense is, is that platforms did take this seriously. And when I've talked to people who have worked with platforms, and I've certainly worked with tube sites in my time in the industry, um, this is something that people take deadly seriously, and mm-hmm. they remove these things upon alert. What happens is, um, so you have, the, talk about how moderation works on an adult site. And I think that this is you know, as valid today as it was 10 years ago. Content is moderated before it goes up. That means that someone, usually in conjunction with AI, reviews a piece of content. Now, they may skim through it because they're dealing with a lot of studio content and they're not, you know, and they, they know that this is coming from a reputable place. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically, you know, and AI is generally scanning it to make sure that it doesn't correspond to any sort of child porn CSAM hashtags. And you also have things like keywords, right? Where it's, it's getting flagged if somebody is using a keyword associated with illegal content. So those are ways that, that um, content is reviewed before it goes live. And again, this, it's very intense now, but I, I, you know, 10 years ago, these were still the processes that were generally being used. Our processes 10 years ago, are still better than they are at Facebook today. Because if you post to Facebook or you post to Twitter, that image goes live immediately. Mm -hmm. So Facebook and Twitter, when they moderate, what they're doing is they're removing an image that's already been out there, right? That has already been posted, that other people have already seen, that's already been distributed. Um, Whereas adult sites, they catch the vast majority of those before they go live, right? Before mm-hmm. they're, they're seen by anybody. Um, it doesn't mean they're perfect. It doesn't mean that things don't get through. It doesn't mean that somebody looks at somebody and says, I think that person's 18 and it turns out they're 17. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, nobody is going to be perfect. But even from our early days, the adult industry was better than the mainstream tech industry is today. And so there's a lot of conversations about moderation that you know, happened in the documentary that I would have loved a little bit more context in. Um, you know, they have a moderator who worked at, at, at Pornhub, and I'm, I'm not clear if it was, you know, how recently it seems from people that I've spoken to that it was from sort of more of the early days of, of Pornhub, um, you know, 10 or so years ago, where they talk about, you know, reviewing 400 hours of footage a day and, and sort of scrolling through it. Uh, you know, of course, they don't talk about the other ways in which things are moderated prior to that. And they don't talk about the fact that we moderate before things go up rather than, you know, after the, the crime has already been committed. Um, but today, if you're going to look at Pornhub or, or sort of any of these other uh, tube sites, what you generally see are the uploader has to be known. Right. So there has to be somebody to trace it back to number one. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I upload revenge porn. Pornhub can tell you, oh, you know, even if I fake a document, even if I forge everything, even I can go back and say, this is the person, this is their legal identity, and you can prosecute them. That is a huge deterrent for people sharing this material. I could right now go on Twitter, create a fake account, upload something, and no one would know where it came from, Mm -hmm. right? Um, You know, and so I think that um, you know, that's the first deterrent. The second, obviously, is if you're monetizing content, everybody gets verified uh, in terms of their, you know, upload their ID and their age, you know, and their model release, you know, but even if if that's not part of it, even if you're just uploading content without monetizing, right, you're just uploading something for free, it's still going through scans where, you know, there is an, an, a machine learning AI that looks at it and says, this person look underage. Is there anything in here that indicates that it's underage, um, you know, or, you know, illegal or something like that? There's so many different things that go into it before it even gets up. Um, you know, so that's the first part of moderation is pre-moderation. It's the stuff that the, the adult industry does that no one else does. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's moderation that happens after things go up, right? Which is, Someone calls you and says, hey, listen, there's a video of me. I was 16 
getting sexually assaulted at a party and someone has uploaded it to your site, whether that's Twitter or Pornhub or, you know, whoever else, um, I need you to take it down. And that's another form of moderation. How quickly sites re- report to that. So how quickly people remove that type of content. Mm-hmm. Um, there are claims that are made in the doc that Pornhub was not um, so quick to remove content. The odd part is, is that there is, you know, there's currently a lawsuit against Pornhub. Uh, it was filed with 33 people, a uh, class action. In their own filing, the when they talk about, okay, this happened to me, right? This, uh, 10 years ago, this video was uploaded to me. I reported it to Pornhub. Pornhub removed it. Um, Pornhub actually seems, when you actually get away from the, uh, the, the uh you know the press conferences and mm-hmm. the, the campaigns by these faith-based groups actually seems fairly responsive even in their worst case scenarios these are things that are coming down within a day or two i talked to a revenge porn uh organization in the uk recently um and was asking them about uh how these companies it, how companies in adult respond to reports of revenge porn and they said you know Pornhub's the gold standard they remove mm-hmm. things without asking they remove things you know the minute that we flag something it goes down they they remove first and investigate later so i think that there's a lot of um you know Pornhub is being portrayed in a particular light because a lot of these christian right groups do not like it right mm-hmm. they don't like porn and Pornhub made porn it normalized porn, right? Yeah. It was something that was in the headlines. It was something that people would talk about at the kitchen table, right? It would be like, oh, anal is the number one search. And you would see it in a hundred articles on yeah. Yahoo News. That is very threatening to these these people, right? Who want to keep a lid on sexuality, who are uncomfortable discussing sexuality. And I think that that was ultimately why they chose Pornhub to go after That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And interestingly, after watching the documentary, I watched it along with a bunch of other folks on Twitter. We were tweeting, doing a watch party, live tweeting. I think it was the next day. The announcement came out that Pornhub has been sold, purchased by, is it Ethical, ethical, Ethical Capital Partners? Yeah. What is this all? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What's happening? Was that planned? That's coincidental timing. Like, give us the tea on yeah. what's going on. So, you know, I think that th- that was a shock to me as well. I had I had heard an inkling that something was in the works. Obviously, um, you know, uh, Pornhub and, and, and MindGeek, the parent company, had been looking to sell for a while. That wasn't a, a secret. I think that, um, you know, when you are, uh, the owners had been dragged before Canadian Parliament, you know, one of their homes had been der- burned down. Um, you know, it's, th- these are people who maybe don't want the spotlight or don't want to be associated with porn to begin with, um, because of all the stigma that comes with it. Uh, you know, they were looking to get out. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it was sold. Um, I have not yet spoken with the the new ownership, but I have spoken with a lot of people at Pornhub and, and people who are familiar with the situation. And everybody is, is very optimistic. I have to say that even without sort of internal connections and, and internal confirmation that this is a good thing, um, one of the first things that the uh, one of the new owners did was just give boundless interviews. So mm. to talk to as many people as wanted to talk to him in the press about what was going on, what their, their intentions were. And one of the things that they said that I thought was particularly interesting was they said, he said, you know what? Um, one of the most valuable assets that we have is our technology. You know, we have first in class technology in terms of catching and removing CSAM and illegal content and, and, and that sort of stuff. And we think that actually that is an asset that other platforms, you know, I imagine here, you know, he didn't say Twitter, but but people like Twitter right. would want, right? Because if you think about, you know, think about it six months ago, a year ago, Twitter was talking about doing this uh, sort of OnlyFans competitor. Yeah. Right? Do you remember this? Yep. Yep. Paid follows and, and all of that. And they thought, oh, well, we could do this this sort of copy. And, and their internal company said, we have no idea how to do this and, and prevent illegal content, right? The adult 
industry knows how to do these things, right? We know the difference. It's not just like Facebook, you know, Facebook just removes anything sexual, right? Mm-hmm. They don't differentiate between whether it's consensual, whether it's adult, whatever. It's just carpet bombing. It's carpet bombing censorship. Um, you know, with the adult industry, we actually know the nuances. We know the difference between BDSM and violence, right? We know what a model release looks like and shouldn't look like. We know what, you know, um, you know, what to look for when somebody is is uploading a fake ID or things like that, because that's what we do. And so, you know, I think that in terms of the Mind Geek sale, it's very interesting. You know, obviously a lot remains to be seen, but mm-hmm. they seem to really, to really um want to go on the offense in some ways about these things and say, listen, the stuff that's being said about it is just absolutely not true. And I think that that's very heartening. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really curious to see how this plays out. I have my fingers crossed. It's going to, it's going to be good. And I, yeah. So there's, you know, this is this little thing, right? It's seemingly little thing. I'll put it that way to people who maybe aren't in this industry who, yes, they care about censorship and what's going on, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, they're oh they're trying to get rid of Pornhub. That sucks. Um, But like you and I know when we see this, we see it's like, it is this little drop in this much bigger picture. Um, so let's talk about that. Like why, first of all, why should people care about like this one thing and this, this documentary and what these groups are doing? Um, how does that fit into the big picture? And also, I guess kind of ties to it. Why do you care? Like, wh- how did you get so passionate about this? Well, I mean, porn is the the canary in the coal mine of free speech, right? Mm-hmm. It is the thing with the fewest amount of defend of of people willing to defend it publicly, right? Mm-hmm. People may, you know, enjoy porn. They may find that it's it's entertaining in their own life, and they may find that it helps their sex life. It it may be something that they they see as perfectly harmless. But if you are a politician or a public figure or even a journalist, um. It's not something that you you can cop to, right? It's still something that um, you know teachers and lawyers and doctors, if if their porn histories are exposed or if they 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 are going to lose their job, right? Like the, there's just such tremendous stigma. You have you know someone's porn history shows up in a custody battle, right? That's going to be used against them. There's all of these ways in which it is radioactive, and so I think that when you are looking at you know censorship it's an easy first step to start building laws that say you know what we're going to you know yeah the first amendment's important but we need to go around it because of this right this is we need to to get rid of this and what they've been doing is and this is i think what you've been alluding to like in terms of like this isn't the first time we've seen this this old thing again um is what they say is it's harmful to minors Right. And and certainly adult content is for adults. Right. It, it, it's called adult content for a reason. If the the, you know, porn industry, you know, had its struggles it, and could get rid of everybody who was under 18 from being on their sites immediately, they would. There's no value in it on a business level to have people in there. All they do is burn up server space. They can't purchase anything. Right. Like this is not this is not an industry, despite what the detractors say, that want teenagers on their sites, um, you know, either in front of the camera or behind, you know, or, or purchasing. Um, but what we see is that so they go after porn first and they go after marginalized sexualities. Right. So you go after LGBTQ plus you go after kink fetish, BDSM, right? You go after anybody who is poly, you're going after anybody who is non-heteronormative. So if you look at this, it is, yes, we're talking about porn in particular and ways in which, um, you know, bigots are trying to take porn sites down or shut porn sites down. Um, But you have to understand in context with across the country, all we see are school library bans, right? Where they are trying to remove um, LGBTQ plus books, right? Where you're trying to remove, you know, uh, Toni Morrison, where you're trying to, there were you, they're using a fear about sex to pull all of these things from the shelves. If you look at Florida, you have don't say gay, right? Mm-hmm. They want to remove sex from the public square. There was a story yesterday that came out that, um, a principal in Florida had been fired because one of their teachers had shared in an art class, in an art, you know, in, 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 a, in an art lesson, 
had shared a picture of Michelangelo's David. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, it, probably the most famous statue in the world. And um, because it is nude, um, that was a viol- you know, parents went crazy. And so they fired, uh, you know, the principal was fired. Um, so this is, you know, I mean, and obviously there are all the trans healthcare bills that are happening across the country, right? All with the same drumbeat of we need to protect the children. The p- children are being groomed. The children are being sexualized. Um, you know, all of these things. And so, you know, obviously you want to understand in context, you also understand that when they put past these laws that affect uh, pornography, those laws are then much easier to use to, to censor other types of content that they might define as harmful to minors. So a lot of the, there's across the country, there's probably two dozen bills that create age verification for adult content. And great, we shouldn't have kids looking at adult content. What these bills end up doing is they have a broad definition of what's harmful to minors, including the nipple of a female breast. Mm. Right. If it's going (laughs) the nipple of a female breast in conjunction with, you know, it's going to get a kid aroused, you know, like there's these sort of things. And that is a broad, you know, that's a a broad scope. Right. That means you can take down sex ed. That means that you can take down, you know, LGBTQ information. Right. Mm -hmm. If it's if it's describing sexuality, we're not talking about, you know, they they make you think that it is just about, you know, hardcore pornography and sexually explicit media. No, it is about any sort of representation of sexuality. And that's really why we're the dangerous. I mean, we always have to stand up for the First Amendment, uh, especially when it comes to sexuality, because sexuality is the foot in the door to larger censorship. Yeah. And I mean, we've seen it repeat. Look at like pre-World War II Germany. That's who, you know, got attacked first. And yeah, it's 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 all terrifying it's all absolutely terrifying the latest thing i saw was they're going after cartoons like what is the what i'm like oh my god my god what is this about (laughs) now Hey guys, I'm Holly Randall, and I am an erotic photographer, director, and producer. I started a podcast called Holly Randall Unfiltered, where I interview the biggest names in the adult industry. My goal with this show is to show the world what the adult industry is really like and what really happens behind the scenes, what these porn stars are actually like as people, not just as performers, and show the world this is a real job. We actually take it seriously. And we have a lot of fun doing it at the same time. So make sure that you tune in to Holly Randall Unfiltered. You can find it anywhere you get your podcasts on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, Stitcher, you name it. And come learn what the porn industry is actually like. Let's face it, relationships can be tough, and it's even tougher to find quality advice when you need it. That's why we spend hours looking at the latest research to help you understand which relationship advice is gold and which advice is garbage. We are the hosts of the Multiamory Podcast, a weekly show dedicated to helping your relationships become happier and healthier. This is not your mother's relationship advice show. Whether you are monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. Check out what some of our listeners have to say. I can always find an episode to help me process and find perspective with whatever it is that I'm going through in the moment. We're addressing both healthy and unhealthy habits has really shaped who I strive to be as a partner and a person. Sometimes I read a title and I'm like, this one isn't going to apply to me. And then listen to it anyway. And it always does. (laughs) So if you're tired of one-size-fits-all relationship advice, check out Multiamory with over 400 episodes and new episodes every week. Was they're going after cartoons? Like, what is the, what it, I'm like, oh my God, my God, <laughs> what is this about <laughs> now? <funny. laughs> You know, you and I have been around the block for better or worse with with these things. And it is, you know, like people work themselves up into, you know, a, 
a work up a lather around like, oh my God, this is going to, you know, this is going to poison children. Well, guess what? There's a lot of stuff in the world that is not right for children. It doesn't mean that we have to child safe the, re- the world for the rest of us, right? If you were a parent, there are device filters on every device most often free that you can put on to keep your kid from accessing any adult site or, or, but um, the, what these people want to do is sort of censor the rest of the internet, right? They want to set, they don't want it to, they don't want it to exist in the first place. And kids are a good excuse to get that censored. So what we see, what I uh, noticed the other day was I'd gotten sort of three mailers um, in the past three weeks that had been going after um, cartoon porn or hentai or, or, you know, various sort of line drawings. And, and basically these uh, faith-based groups saying like, this is a real danger. We need, you know, this is the sort of the, the grooming that's happening. These, you know, adult cartoons are being used to lure children and there's just no evidence of it. You know, I think that, but again, it's something that if you can say, oh, yes, the, the porn industry is somehow going after your children. Nobody wants a six year old on your site. Like nobody wants it. This is not something that we are looking for. This is something that, you know, we're parents, we're families. We have kids. Nobody wants kids looking at this content. Adults have creative sexualities. You know, it is not all missionary position and long sleeves, right? We like, you may not understand it, but there are people who like cosplay and there are people who like cartoons and there are things that get different people off. This is, you know, these are, we've had generations of people who have had video games. Our sexuality, you know, is, you know, polymorphously for rehearse, right? It's, right? it's great. It's amazing. But they look at these things and they think, God, this is the devil, you know, mm-hmm. and I think that that's ultimately, you know, you think about the the burning of Kiss records or the burning of comic books in the 80s or, you know, yes. um, Tipper Gore trying to shut down music. Right. You're, you're like, you've got wet ass pussy on the radio. You're going to tell me that like th- that a cartoon that is, you know, on an adult site is the biggest threat to your kids. No, like this is you need to be in charge of what your kids do and don't look at it. The answer is not censoring everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and they've really, you know, found something with the, what about the children? Because any opposition to like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You know, it's like, so you want children to be, and it's like, no, (laughs) it's nuanced. Hey, you know, um, well, these yeah. are people that operate in binaries, right? Like, I think that, like, if you look at, th- th- there's something in, you know, both or- authoritarian and faith-based groups that, that sort of say, like, there is good and there is evil, right? And this is a war that's in it. And so we come into it and say, well, actually, you know what? It's complicated. You know, these things are not necessarily bad. They're not for kids, but we need to figure out a way to do it. But we should do it in a way that doesn't encourage government surveillance. And maybe this is a way that you could do it. And they say, no, all you, you're doing is standing in the way of what, you know, what is right. Right. Um, So, and and your sinners and and all the rest of it. So I think that like, it's hard to have conversations with them on that. I think that we have, you know, I've reached out numerous times. I've tried to debate some of these people. And at the end of the day, you know, one of them said after the movie came out, uh, you know, and the movie is quite nuanced, as you point out, right? Right. It it talks a lot about the problems with moderation on MindGeek. It is not a, it's certainly not a propaganda film for MindGeek. And Someone came out and he said, you know what? This industry is rotten to the core. It just has to go. You know, and that's that's sort of the approach that they're they're doing. So they're looking for really any lever to pull to, to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I just, you know, and, and of course for me, and I know our regular listeners will be like, yeah, I'm with you. It all leads back to control and shame and, you know, keeping our systems going and capitalism. like. Hey, if if we're actually authentic and feeling, you know, we can live our lives freely and make our own decisions and we're happy, we're not as easily exploitable or controllable. So, yeah. I mean, really it all do- I I hate it that's like everything leads back to capital. But no. It does. I mean, no, 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 no. yeah. <laughs> it <does. laughs> but it does if you look at like <laughs> one of the the more interesting things that I, you know, sort of dove into in the past couple of years is sort of you look at um the the origins of authoritarianism and there is a move whenever sort of you're you're moving towards fascism what happens is 
a real focus on the family because the family is sort of the original authoritarian unit, right? It it it, it has structure and order and a, a father at top and a subservient mother and kids who learn the rules and, and all the rest of it. And um it's you know, I mean the fascists will sort of say this is the 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 fundamental unit of the state is a strong family, you know, with a with a strong head and and a traditional subservient wife. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think that that is as you sort of move to this globally, right? As you move to this the culturally, you need to stamp out all of the disparate expressions of sexuality where you say, you know what, actually. I've heard my entire life that that being gay is terrible, but you know what? It turns out it's not. That's a, I mean, it, it turns out that that is a radical move, mm-hmm. right? That is a be like, oh, you know what? The things that have been taught to me by the church around sex and, and shame were maybe not true. That is, you know, you're questioning the authority of right. the people, and I think that that's a revolutionary act. Yeah, it really is, and even even for us to have the capacity and the understanding to talk about it in a nuanced way and to understand it and to parse through the logic that right there is revolution. Like critical thinking is revolutionary. Absolutely. Being able to see the nuance. So like at this point, you know, we've just unearthed a whole pile of shit um, that may be having some of us feeling like, Oh my God, this is, this is huge. Like, how do we stop this runaway train bus car where whatever Keanu Reeves movie you want to compare it to? <laughs> um, but there are things that like people can do, just your average folks, your average citizens that aren't involved in this industry. They're they're not activists or not. What can the everyday person do to help stop this Keanu Reeves vehicle? You know, I mean, I think that. You know, one thing is is obviously doing things like listening to the podcast, because I think that you see these headlines, right? If you look at the headlines from Pornhub from three years ago, there were a lot of people even within our industry who were like, oh, was that was happening? This is what Pornhub was doing. I think that it it you should understand that there is nuance there and you should do the work to go in and, and try to understand it. it. It doesn't mean that you have to defend anything that's happening, but to be able to go in and be like, oh, okay, I understand what's happening. I understand the complexity. Look for the nuance, look for the complexity, um, you know, and be suspicious of, you know, some of these groups that are claiming, oh, we're saving the women, we're saving the children, we're we're against trafficking. Um, they tend to be not as reliable and actually not, you know, they don't care as much about the victims as they do about sort of a larger political agenda. Um, that's certainly one thing. I think that, you know, for, you know, communities of, you know, sexuality, um, you know, I would certainly say, you know, I, I look at this as a storm, right? I look at this the way that you would look at a hurricane. It, it happens every 10 or 20 years, right? Something like this comes in and, um, you know, I want to say that that if you're vulnerable, batten down the hatches, right? Protect yourself. Make sure that um, you know it doesn't mean self censor. It doesn't mean don't do the things that 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 make you happy. But understand that like this is going to be a tough time, and make sure that you're protected. It's almost like put on your own mask so that you can help other people in the event of an emergency landing, right? So make sure that that you understand the situations. You understand if there's particular vulnerability to you that you have a good lawyer, right, or that you have uh some knowledge of the situation um but you know i think that and obviously talk to people right i think that people like i get into conversations all the time you sit down next to somebody at a dinner party and they say something you know about the adult industry and you think well that's actually not true or i heard this other thing and i think that you don't have to get into a war but Mm -hmm. i i think that it's worth sort of Saying, you know what, actually, I, you know, I mean, watch the Pornhub doc, right? Watch, um, you know, um, listen to the podcast, you know, get on Twitter, understand what sex workers are saying, because I think that that is the nuance. You know, you brought up SESTA FOSTA, you know, which was obviously this, this legislation that, that led to a crackdown on sexual speech online, particularly for sex workers. Um, it was also a piece of legislation that propelled a lot of sex worker issues into the mainstream consciousness. You know, there was a lot of coverage of SESTA FOSTA. As much damage as it did, it was horrible to uh, online sex workers, particularly. Um, it meant that journalists were suddenly take, paying attention to these things and paying attention okay. to sex worker issues. 
I think that that the the biggest thing that you can do is orient yourself to understand that sex workers really are the canary in the coal mine. What happens to them is a preview of what's going to happen to you um, and and to be firm about defending them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think about, uh, you know, just you and I, we've been around the block many, 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 many times. And I know a lot of, uh, you know, folks in our circles, folks listening, they are younger, they're younger millennials, they're Gen Z, and this is new, you know, and I think back to, to some of what we've seen, we've seen the, the, uh, congressional hearings about like Ozzy Osbourne records and satanic panic and like two live crew in the early nineties, you know, and just recently, I'm not sure even, I think I was talking to my kids actually about like the history of censorship. And I was like, Oh, two live crew. And they're like, what's that? I'm like, let's pull up <laughs> YouTube. And you know, I was giving them the history lesson. And um, we pulled up some of the, the, the clips from the hearings on YouTube and look at, I remember at the time it felt real serious. Like this yeah. feels that it felt real serious. And looking back, I'm like, Oh my God, we were such an embarrassment. I cannot <laughs> believe that this was like the issue of the day. Yeah. And it was really easy to see like the, the hidden motives underneath why these things are being questioned, et cetera, et cetera. And also the nuance, why some of it maybe did need to be regulated a little mm-hmm. bit more or thought about in, in a more thoughtful way, but yeah. not necessarily like, oh, you all need to, you know, it needs to be done kind of thing. Yeah, I'm going to arrest you. I mean, that was what yeah. was happening was that where they were, you know, arresting people for obscenity for music. And I think that, you know, you brought up like, what can people do? And in TikTok, like, honestly, I think that there are so many people out there that have platforms and, you know, I, you know, I'm only one person, you're only one person. We can only do what we have in our own domain. You know, these people, I I would love people who are, you know, who have platforms to use them, right? That's the biggest thing that you could do is educate yourself, you know, and and make, you know, a talk that is really that, that sort of delves into this because I don't have time in my day you know, to, to get into it. And that's also not where I excel. So I need the new generation to come in and say, okay, I'm going to educate myself and I'm going to break it. And I am always happy to help. You know, I, I always encourage people to, to, to join, if they're in the adult industry, to join Free Speech Coalition. It's freespeechcoalition.com. Follow us at FSC Army, you know, or to, you know, I mean, even if you're not in the industry, you can give a donation. We are really the, the front lines of this fight. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. 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 So before we wrap up, what didn't we get to, you know, was there anything like in the documentary that maybe wasn't in the documentary you want to point out or any last final thing that you want to leave folks with? You know, I mean, I would say obviously pay your sex workers. You know, I think that like, this is the thing we are at a, at an, and this is a sort of maybe a note of hope. In this, you know, we are in a reactionary moment. Don't be fooled, right? This is, you know, people are trying to clump down on progress. They're trying to move the clock back. They are nervous about trans kids and porn on the internet and and all the rest of it. Um, But the nature of a reactionary movement is, is it, it is backwards looking and it's a reaction to progress that we have made. You know, I think that what has happened in the past two or three years, and this is is in the dock to a certain extent, is that we have, you know, it's no longer 2,000 people in the Valley making porn, right? Um, It is a million people globally, right? More than a million, I think, that only, you know, on OnlyFans alone. And these people are making porn that is their own, right? Where they control the, the, the narrative, where they control what they want to do. Um, they control the body. They, they decide, you know, you know, like they're sort of free from the body types that studios might require or distributors might require, right? They express their sexuality in any number of ways. This is tremendously scary to the conservatives, right? The people who want to shut down porn because it destabilizes their narrative. So I think that like we have a very powerful community. We have a very large community, right? I've fought these battles in the past. And sometimes it was just like, like I said, it was a handful of performers and a handful of studios 
trying to like make change and we have made change right the supreme free speech coalition has won battles at the supreme court but i think that what has changed now and what gives me hope is that there are so many other people who understand how this is affecting them and understand the 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 importance and that when you're telling these stories as they do in the doc right that these are affecting real people right these are affecting mm-hmm. you know people who are independent creators who are paying for school who are putting a down payment on a home who are you know clearly not being controlled or exploited or whatever the narrative is that the the anti-porn feminists and the the, the christian right want to put forward so i think that we have a lot more power than we imagine and i think that it's going to be a tough couple of years to get through mm-hmm. but i think that we ultimately you know have you know time and uh, you know, the right on our side. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, you know, it's now that I'm, I'm, I've absorbed this episode and I'm thinking back to our last couple of episodes, I want to remind regular listeners, the theme is we are all fighting the same fight. You know, we had three, our, our, our episode with Veronica Kestrel about trans and gender nonconforming folks in the kink community, you know, our episode with Dr. Candace about race and sexuality. And, and then this episode, and they all seem like very different topics, but when you boil it down to the lowest common denominator, we're all talking about the same thing and we're all fighting the same fight. So yeah. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, what a where I'm going to, you know, definitely have like your Twitter and stuff mm-hmm. in the show notes. Is there any other like shout out you want to give or place you want to direct people before we, before we say ta-ta? No, I'm a, I'm an activist, not a salesman. So okay. I'll leave it to you. But cool. those things cool. are, you don't want to like uh, sell it on your mixtape, you know, I <laughs> think like, okay, all right. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be starting an OnlyFans to, to try to raise money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Mike. Have a good one. You too, Sunny. Bye-bye. All righty. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to American Sex. What's that? You want more? Well, you can start by streaming our TV show on Showtime, Sex with Sunny Megatron. Then pop on over to SunnyMegatron.com. Everything's there. You can get updates on my new book, check out my sex ed and BDSM workshops, learn how to book me for your organization or for coaching. You know, we also want to hang out with you too, right? So come join our Discord community or follow along on TikTok or Instagram, Twitter, all the social media. I'm Sunny Megatron everywhere. And you can catch Ken on Twitter or tune in to his weekly D&D games on Twitch. If you want to support the show, a great way to do that is simply to tell people about it. Make a TikTok or tweet about your favorite part of this episode. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe and leave a review too. And if you're a ride or die American fucker, you're going to want to join our Patreon community. We'll send you official American fucker stickers and you'll get a lot more too at patreon.com slash American sex. Now, just in case you happen to be one of the few that still has disposable income in this late stage capitalist hellscape. Well, when you're shopping for a new sex toy, BDSM gear, kink Academy membership, or other things, please patronize our sponsors and affiliates you'll get a discount and it helps us too. win-win all those links and codes are in our show notes thanks american fuckers we appreciate the heck out of you see you next time